where we can come and get a good word from the Lord and help us get through to Sunday. Hallelujah. Come on, let's put those hands together. How many feel blessed tonight? Oh, let me hear you say bless, 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 bless. Let me hear you say bless. When we go, when we go, we cast down every stronghold, sickness and poverty must cease. For the devil is defeated. We are blessed, 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 blessed. Oh, blessed, 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 blessed. Let me hear you say blessed, blessed, blessed. blessed. When we come and when we go, we cast down every strong of sickness and poverty in the sea. For the devil is defeated. We are blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every strong of sickness and poverty must see. For the devil is defeated. We are one more time. We're blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold. Sickness and poverty must cease. For the devil is defeated. We are blessed. Cause late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your favor. How many believe that tonight? Oh, late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your favor. Oh, help me. Late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your favor. Oh, late in, late in the midnight hour. God's gonna turn it around. He's gonna work in your favor. Late in the midnight hour. 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 God's gonna turn it around. 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 He's gonna turn it around. God's gonna turn it around. God's gonna turn it around. And 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 around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many believe that in late in the midnight hour, God can turn things around? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That made me feel good. Didn't it make you feel good? Hallelujah. 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 I was sitting every week, I think, what am I going to sing this week? What am I going to do this week? And I thought back to a song I wrote some years ago with a friend. And y'all might not know this, but I hope that it touches you. Um, it's all, it talks about getting closer to God. And it talks about sometimes we do things that cause a separation. But when we honestly go to him and say, God, I want to be closer. I want to be closer to you. Hallelujah. Just change what you want to change. Thank you, God. I want to be closer to you, Lord. Submit 
lived my life all the way. There are some things I've been hiding. You reveal that they're in the way. Deliver me from those iniquities and shower me with your grace. Pour into me your fullness, God, so my life won't be the same. I want to be closer to you, closer to you, closer, 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 closer to you. I hear a voice speaking softly. It sounds like you're calling my name. So many times I've ignored you, God. I let things get in the way. But I'm in a place of tranquility. I need you to know I am listening. Fill me, God, with your spirit, Lord. And mold me so my life won't be the same. I want to be closer to you. Jesus, I want to walk like you walk, I want to talk like you talk, I want to move like you move, I want to be closer to you, yeah, I want you to change me, how you want me to be, I want you to mold me, into what you expect me to be. I want to be closer. I want to be close, closer to you. Oh, I want to be closer to you, Lord. Submit my life all the way. There are some things I've been hiding. You reveal that they're in the way. Deliver me from those iniquities. I need you to know I am listening. Pour into me your fullness, God. So my life won't be the same. I want to be close. Hallelujah. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's get ready for our pastor, Pastor Curtis. Come on. Let's give God some praise here in the sanctuary. Those who are viewing at home, you give him praise in your own way as well. God, I want to be closer. God, I want to be closer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this wonderful opportunity of having gathered in your house once again. Thank you for those who thought it not robbery to make their way here to share. And though we may be few in number, we're reminded that a large crowd has never mattered with you. For you declared that when you're for us, is more than the whole world being against us. We're reminded that you say in Matthew 18 that where
where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you will be in the midst as well. And as long as you're here, Father, that's all that really matters. But you've given us the added blessing of people being here tonight, and for that we're grateful. We thank you for our persons who are viewing online. And God, we pray that they would treat this moment as if they were in the building, that they would be attentive to all that is about to happen in this place. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Well, again, welcome to all of you who are sharing with us in the building as well as those who are viewing online. We thank God that he has brought us to the midway point of another week, of another week God has kept and sustained us, and for that we're grateful. To those in the building as well as those online, we say welcome to Calvary. Calvary, Calvary, welcome to Calvary. Where salvation is free. Calvary, Calvary. Welcome to Calvary, where the blessings are is showing. Welcome to Calvary, where the blessings are overflowing. Welcome to Calvary, where salvation is free. Much, thank you so much. Let's give it up to our worship team, to Juan and Kenise and Wayne and Quay and Aaron. Let's give them a hand. We appreciate you, brother, and appreciate you, sisters. Thank God for you and all of you who share with us tonight in the building. We are grateful to have you here, Sister Joy. We thank God for you and Johnny Hodges and Daniel Small and Sandra Patillo and. Kenneth Parks and Mary Williams, we bless God for all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. As we prepare to go into a moment of prayer, I am once again honored and delighted to have Minister Latoya Salt Marshall, who will come and who will lead us. And just before she comes, let me just share with you again our prayer list. Continue to pray for First Lady and our family, our son Andy and his family out in California, Brother Charles Edwards, the brother of Mother Joanne Smith, continue to lift him in prayer. His wife of 45 years died a couple of weeks ago. Mother Joanne Turner, continue to pray for her. Mother Jenny Davis, Mother Charlie Mae Williams, Mother Bernie Shipman, Mother Exie Watts, Brother Charles and Sister Lovey Bailey, Yvonne Greenwich, Melvin and Velma McCann, David and Karen Dixon, Carolyn and Melody Moss, Ina and Doug Copeland, Lonnie and Flora Blake. In a few weeks, we'll be kicking off our summer camp once again, and we need for you to cover it in prayer, cover it in prayer. Certainly continue to pray for all of our nurses and health care professionals who are still on the front lines of battling COVID, all of our teachers, all of our educators, Let's lift them in prayer. Cheryl and Jabari Wilder, Shara Morgan, Stephanie Sims, Tracy Jones, Linda Hyman, Marie Williams, China Zachary. Pray for our president and our vice president, all of our government leaders. You don't have to agree with them in order to pray for them. In fact, Timothy tells us, in 1 Timothy, rather, Paul tells us that this is pleasing to God when you and I will pray for our secular leaders. And so I want to encourage you tonight to lift them in prayer. Lift up Joe Biden and lift up Kamala Harris and, and lift up Brian Kemp and, and lift up all of our elected officials. Lift them to God in prayer. Jesus, keep me the cross then a precious fountain free to
flows from Calvary's mountain in the In the cross, be my glory. sanctuary and weather your arm and just remind yourself as we go into prayer for you are Alpha and Omega we worship you our Lord you are worthy to Ladies, just say it for me one time. You are Alpha and Omega. you on today, Lord God. Lord God, take away anything that was contrary to your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Even right now, Lord God, bless those that are here and bless those that are on their way, Lord God. Thank you for the press, Lord God, for, Lord God, we know that you are, Lord God. God is, Lord God. Continue to give us a praying spirit on tonight, Lord God. Your word says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowl and from the noisome pestilence. 
He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler, Lord God. Some need you for one thing, and some need you for another, Lord God, but we all need you, Lord God. We need you in a very special way, even right now, Lord God. Somebody is racking in pain in their body, Lord God. Somebody is going through in their mind, Lord God. Somebody, Lord God. Lord God, somebody is calling on you even right now on behalf of somebody else, Lord God. Bless those that are standing in the gap even right now, Lord God. Representing those that are too stubborn to call on you for themselves, Lord God. And we just say thank you for those that stand in the gap, Lord God. We thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ, that stood in the gap for us, Lord God, to cover the multitude of sins that we were committing these human bodies called flesh, Lord God. And we say thank you, Lord God, for the sacrifice, Lord God. Thank you for him being, Lord God, wounded, Lord God. Thank you for him being beaten, Lord God. Thank you for every strike that he took for us, Lord God, declaring us healed, Lord God. And we just say thank you, Lord God, for the minstrels of this house, Lord God, the prophetic psalmist that are digging the ground, Lord God. Lord God, bringing somebody through even right now, Lord God. We know that you is, Lord God. We know that you are, Lord God, and we know that you will be, Lord God, and we just say thank you for being it right now, Lord God. We declare and decree that it is. It is so right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody doesn't have to wait until tomorrow. It is so in this hour, Lord God, and we just say thank you for declaring and decreeing it right now, Lord God. Bless the word even right now, Lord God. Stir up the gifts in this place right now, Lord God. We know, Lord God, that the pews may be a little bit empty, Lord God, but spiritually they're full, and we just say thank you even right now for that, Lord God. Lord, touch your under-shepherd even right now, Lord God. Thank you for the assignment that has been placed on his life, Lord God. Thank you for the assignment that had been placed on his family's life, Lord God. And thank you for the assignment that you have given each and every one of us, Lord God. Help us to run with it and see what the end is going to be, Lord God. Help us to not get weary, Lord God. Help us to not get weak, Lord God. But help us to accept that I am that I am, even right now, on this very night, on this very hour, Lord God. And we just say thank you for your word, Lord God. That's going to be food to our spirit, food to our bodies, food to our mind. In Jesus' name we do pray and we say amen. Amen and amen again. I once was lost in sin, then Jesus took me in. And the witless little light from heaven filled my soul. He filled my heart with love, and he wrote my name above. And uh, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear. He will answer by and by. Oh, feel a little prayer will turn. And I know a little fire is burning When I have a little talk with Jesus Makes it right Come on and put those hands together wherever you are God bless you Thank you so much, Minister Salt Marshall Take the word and turn again to the book of Isaiah Isaiah 49 We're concerned with verse 1 And most importantly verse the B section of verse 1 of Isaiah 49 we're continuing our teaching in light of the fact of what's going on in our nation surrounding the leaked opinion from the US Supreme Court uh, that seems to suggest that they are going to overturn Roe vs. Wade decision that was handed down in 1973 that legalized abortion and should they overturn that decision, it will mean that abortion is no longer federally protected. And so there are many arguments and many things that are being said 
Some are happy about the leaked opinion. Others are greatly disturbed. In fact, there is great unrest in our nation because of what the Supreme Court may do with Roe vs. Wade. And so we want to see what the Word of God says, not what the talking heads on uh, political radio and television have to say. And we don't care so much about what the Republicans say or the Democrats say. We want to see what God says about this very, very hotly contested issue. And in Isaiah chapter 49, ver the B clause of verse 1, the Lord hath called me from the womb and from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And so we're simply using that particular phrase from that verse as a kind of launching pad for our discussion related to abortion. We open this dialogue on last Wednesday and we want to try to conclude it now but as I mentioned January the 22nd 1973 in paraphrasing what Franklin Delano Roosevelt the president of the United States during World War II said Sandra he said concerning D-Day when the Japan Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor President Roosevelt said, Johnny, that it was a day that would live on in infamy. And for many people, January the 22nd, 1973, is such a date when the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion in the now infamous Roe versus Wade decision. And since that time, Elder Glennis, over 62 million abortions have been done in America. Uh, from a Christian's perspective and from the Word of God's perspective, we would say more people have died in abortion clinics than have died in all of the wars that America has ever been engaged. Over 62 million, going all the way back to the American Revolution, going all the way back to the Civil War, going all the way back to World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, the war in Vietnam, uh, Gulf War I, Gulf War II, our years in Afghanistan, and presently no more people have died on the battlefield in America's wars than have died in abortion clinics across America. Now, of course, of course, this has the Roe vs. Wade decision has led to a great deal of hostility in our nation. And we shared with you the views and the sides in this culture war. You have the pro-abortionists who are for abortionists, and then you have the pro-lifers who are against abortion, and then you have the fence straddlers known as pro-choice. The pro-choice people say, that I am not anti-abortion and I'm not pro-life. I'm simply for a woman having the power to make the choice as it relates to her own body, as it relates to her reproductive health. And then finally, finally, Minister Salt Marshall there is what we call the Biblicist. And the Biblicist says that I'm neither pro-abortion, anti-abortion, or pro-choice but I'm for the Bible. I'm for what the Word of God says. I'm for what the Word of God says. And so last week we shared with you that the Bible teaches, and this is the paramount question in this debate, when does life begin? When does life begin? Does it begin after so many weeks or months in a woman's womb? Or does life begin, Mary, at conception? We believe the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. And we shared with you in our first point last week that conception is an act of God. No woman gets pregnant without God allowing it to happen. Remember what he said about Ruth. Remember what he said about Ruth in Ruth 4 and 13. It said, and the Lord gave her conception. And the Lord gave her conception because conception is an act of God. But not only is conception, we said, an act of God. The next thing that we noted 
was that pregnancy is a gift from God. Pregnancy is a gift from God. Every woman that is blessed of God, every woman that conceives a child, that child is a gift from God. But of course, the argument with that line of thought is, but pastor, what if the pregnancy is a result of rape or incest? The woman should have to live with a reminder of that horrific event for all of her life. And so that's why I'm for abortion only in the case of rape or incest. And of course, the Bible's answer to that is, even when man does something as evil and as despicable or as rape or incest, God is able to bring some good out of that situation. And many of us, we are keenly aware of the fact that during slavery, many of our foreparents, our great-great-grandmothers and our great-grandmothers were raped by slave owners and that's the only reason your granddaddy or grandmama came into existence. It was as a result of rape. But what happened to them, it did not stop them from going on and building a great legacy of which you are part of. In fact, Joseph puts it best in Genesis 50 and 20 when Joseph said concerning how his brothers treated him sold him into slavery, Joseph said that what you meant for evil, the Lord has turned it into good. And then, of course, the twin companion of Genesis 50 and 20 is Romans 8 and 28. For all things work together for good. Now, don't misquote what the verse says. It does not say all things are good. Rape is not good. Incest is not good. Murder is not good. Thievery is not good. Sin is not good. But the verse says all things work together for good. That God has a way of taking the good, the bad, and the ugly of life and working them together to bring something good out of it anyhow. He can bring something good out of it anyhow. And so... And so, as believers of the Word of God, uh, not believers of what's politically correct or what may be popular opinion, but believers of the Word of God, we look at abortion, first of all. Life begins at conception. Conception is an act of God, and then pregnancy is a gift from God. But then point two, point two, point two, life is sacred. In its inception, in its conception, life is sacred in its conception. Why is that? Why is that, Kenneth Parks? Life is sacred in its conception because the one who gives life is God himself. And the God who gives us as human beings life, it is a special, special thing. It is a special thing. Life is sacred and special because God is sacred and special himself. There are two things about life that makes it so special. And the, these two things are evidence, rather. They're evidence in, first of all, creation, and they're evidence in what we call the incarnation. The incarnation simply has to do with Brother Daniel how Jesus Christ came into the world. So life is, life is special in its creation. Uh, is special in its creation. And what makes life special in its creation and its sacredness, Latoya, is this. Humans are made in what we call a mago day, the image of God. Humans are made in the image of God. Look at Genesis chapter 1. And uh, pick up reading along around verse 26, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man was created in the image of God in Imago day, the starting point of understanding why life is special and understanding the truth 
that we are made in the image of God. I know when you look at us today and how we live and how we carry on, sometimes you don't see much of the image of God in us. That image may have been marred and distorted by sin, but every life that is conceived is conceived in the image of God. Whether it's a man, whether it's a woman, whether it's a Jew, whether it's Gentile, whether they are bond, whether they are free, whether they are old, whether they are young, whether they are saved or unsaved, whether they are sick or healthy, that we are all made in the image of God. And the Bible clearly affirms that life is not the product of impersonal chance plus time as evolution teaches, as evolution teaches. And you hear me good now. You hear me good. One of reason why the pro-abortionists have come to the conclusion that a, a, a life at, that at conception is not a life, is, it is born... It is born through the teaching of evolution. It is born through the teaching of evolution. O abortion has deep roots in evolutionary philosophy. It has deep roots in evolutionary philosophy. And you know what evolutionary philosophy basically teaches us is this, is that there's really nothing special about mankind that mankind is simply a higher form of animal, that we are nothing more than a higher form of animal, that years ago, billions of years ago, they tried to tell us that there was nothing but a primordial cell in a pond of water. The cell developed uh, 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 a fin and became a fish. The fish for many years swam along and developed feet and then came out of the water, climbed up into the tree, became a monkey. The monkey fell down, and oops, the days that that was man, that we are nothing but a higher form of animal. And brothers and sisters, the reason why there is such little regard for human life today is because when you teach people, when you tell young people, uh, from the very earliest days in our educational system that they are nothing more than animal, then we shouldn't be surprised that they, started they start acting like animal. But what children need to be taught and what man needs to understand is is that we are more than just animal because we were created in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. God, brothers and sisters, really distinguishes for us, just in case we didn't know it, the difference between man and animal in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Genesis 9 and verse 6. Look at what it says. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, uh, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, man was made and so God in Genesis 9 and 6 clears up any confusion that somebody may have and God says anybody who kills or murders a human being that person shall be killed themselves God institutes in that verse what we call capital punishment because sometimes people will try to make the erroneous argument well pastor if you don't agree with abortion, then certainly you don't agree with capital punishment. Hold on a minute now. We're talking about two different things. Abortion, as far as the Bible is concerned, is the taking of an innocent human life, whereas with capital punishment, one is being punished because they took a human life. Are you with me here tonight? And God says, God says the reason why this is so is because man was made in the image of God. He's made in the image of God. So it, in creation, we see the sacredness of conception. But not only do we see the sacredness of life in conception, we were made in the image of God. But then secondly, we see it 
in what we call again, Johnny, the incarnation. The incarnation, Quay, simply has to do with the fact of deity, God, becoming man. Now, that is evidence in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ validates the sanctity of life. When Jesus Christ was born, Jesus validated the sanctity of life. Because have you ever considered, Wayne, have you ever considered the fact that of all the ways God could have come into the world, God chose to be born. He chose to be born. Now, you do know we're talking about an omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty, El Shaddai God who could have come into this world any way he chose to. If God wanted to, he just could have showed up. If God wanted to, God could have come into this world any other avenue that he chose to, but instead God came into this world through the process of human birth in the person of Jesus. Look at what Galatians says, Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, and look at verse 4, Galatians 4, and verse 4, look at what it says, Galatians chapter 4, and verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come, look, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, and made under the law, born of a woman, born of a woman, as bad as man had messed up. When God got ready to come into this world, God shows up like every other human being. He is born. He's born, and the fact that Jesus Christ was born, he validates birth, and he invalidates abortion. But not only was he born, validates birth, invalidates abortion, but then Jesus lived for 33 years, validating life and invalidating suicide. Because you know, Jesus, Jesus, brothers and sisters, uh, if, if, if he wanted to, he could have done something. He could have done something like that former prisoner guard, uh, the lady uh, that helped the prisoner escape. And when she felt uh, the, the, the law enforcement uh, closing in on her, she took her own life. Jesus could have done something similar to that. When he felt uh, the forces of evil closing in on him in Gethsemane's garden, Jesus could have taken his own life, but he does not do that because he is teaching us with every step he makes that life is important and that God is not a God that condones suicide. But not only that, not only that, brothers and sisters, Jesus then suffers a horrible, horrible death. He suffers a horrible, horrible death. Can you even begin to imagine the suffering that Jesus went through. The Bible says in Gethsemane that sweats that sweat like drops of blood uh, were pouring from his face. They beat him. They spit upon him. They flogged him with a cat of nine tails and they ripped open his body like a bloody ocean of blood streaming. Jesus suffered the nails in his hands. The nails in his feet. Jesus suffered the beaming heat of the Mediterranean sun upon him. Jesus suffered. But again, remember, he's teaching us. And what he's teaching us is he is validating even human suffering. He's validating human suffering. But he is invalidating what we today call euthanasia. What is euthanasia? Euthanasia pretty much is mercy killing. It is mercy killing. It is when a person is suffering with some horrible affliction, whether it's cancer or whether it's dementia or Alzheimer's, and they say to a family member, they say to a friend, don't allow me to stay here to suffer like that. Would you please take me out of my misery? Euthanasia. But look at Jesus. Jesus suffers incredibly 
Jesus goes through horrible suffering, validating suffering, invalidating euthanasia. And then look what Jesus does. The Bible says that when he was on the cross at about the sixth hour, Jesus lifts up his voice and says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gives up the ghost, and Jesus dies like any other man, validating death itself. Are you with me? Validating death itself. Because there's one thing you ought to know about your Jesus, it is this. Whenever Jesus, whatever Jesus put his hands on, he elevated it, didn't he? He took it to a whole nother qualitative level, including death itself. Whenever Jesus put his hands on, he elevated it. He gave it greater significance. One day, he put his hands on water and it turned to wine. One day he put his hands on two fish and five loaves of bread and it became a banquet for thousands to eat from. One day he put his hands on spit and mud and he performed the task of an ophthalmologist by giving sight to the blind. One day his very presence at a wedding elevated it to be a sign that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus put his hands on a cross and elevated an instrument of death into being an instrument of God's salvation. And Jesus, when he put his hands on a woman's womb, he elevated it to a whole nother qualitative state. A whole nother qualitative, qualitative state, in fact, Look at what Elizabeth said to Mary in the Gospel of Luke concerning her pregnancy because the Lord had laid his hands on her. Look at what Elizabeth says to her. Uh, look at Luke uh, chapter 1. And let's pick up around uh, verse 41. And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spoke out with a loud voice and sang, Look, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Because whatever Jesus touches, he changes it to a higher qualitative state. And somebody, you ought to be able to testify, I know that's right, because ever since the Lord laid his hands on me, that I have not been the same, that I have not been the same. And so point number one, point number one, life begins at conception. Point number two, life is sacred in his conception. We see this at creation, that humans are made in the image of God. We see this in the incarnation that Jesus validates the sanctity of life. But then point three, point three, abortion is really spiritual warfare. Abortion is really spiritual warfare. Go back to Genesis, go back to Genesis and look at chapter three and verse 15. Genesis three and verse 15 is a familiar verse, but I just want you to see what's going on here Genesis 3 and 15 the Lord is talking to the serpent and the woman and he says and I will put enmity between thee Satan and the woman and between your seed and her seed and it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel now of course that is the first prophecy of the Messiah in scripture but just look at the warfare that is going on he says seed, he says seed. The fact that he says a woman will have a seed, of course, we know women don't have seeds. Women have eggs. Uh, but this woman is going to have a child that Satan wishes to destroy. And what God said in Genesis 3 and 15 is really a fact that we're dealing with now, this tension, this conflict that takes place for the lives of little babies. When you consider that abortion is spiritual warfare, it goes all the way back here. 
Because after the fall and God confronts the man and woman and the serpent, the first time the gospel is proclaimed, it is here when God's answer to what Satan has done, God's answer to man's sin problem, God's answer for man's sin is the birth of a little baby. Are you with me here now? He also declares war between the serpent, Satan, and the woman, her seed and his seed, and ever since that pronouncement, Satan has had a special hatred towards children. He's had a special hatred towards children. In Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, he attempts to corrupt the godly line, the godly seed. He attempts to corrupt it in Genesis chapter 6. You come to the book of Exodus through Pharaoh. Satan has babies killed in Egypt. And then you look at the history of the nation of Israel. Satan is the power behind them committing human sacrifice of their children on the pagan altars of Molech. And then Jeremiah lifts up a, 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 a plaintive cry for children in Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. Look at what Jeremiah says there in his book, Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. Look at what he says there. Thus saith the Lord, the voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. The weeping of her children uh, refused to be comforted for her children because they were gone. Satan has been at war against children. Of course, when you get to the New Testament and when the Christ child has been born, Remember that Herod, once again, is operating under the control of Satan. And so Herod orders the death of every two-year-old in the land of Jerusalem because Satan hates children. And one of the reasons why Satan hates children is because Satan hates the potential and the possibility of what those children can become. And since 1973, Satan has been doing all he can to stamp out the lives of even more children. In fact, 62 million children have been killed in abortion clinics throughout America. And oh, Calvary, can you even begin to imagine the number of preachers, the number of teachers, the number of Sunday school leaders, the number of missionaries, the number of saints that were killed in that 62 million. I'm here to tell you that Satan hates children. And oh, look at what he's doing, especially in the African American community when it comes to this issue of abortion. Abortion is a form of genocide oh Lord, that is taking place especially in the African-American community. And I hear you, I hear you saying out there, well, preacher, the problem that I have with your position in is that I don't think anybody has a right to tell a woman what she can and cannot do with her own body. Because, preacher, it is her body. Well, hold on a minute. If she is a child of God and if she has received Jesus as her Savior, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, Lord, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you yeah, which you have of God and you're not even your own because you were bought with a price. Yeah, and what Paul is telling us there is 
Yes. If we have been saved by the blood, and if we have been born again, yes, oh Lord, we really don't belong to ourselves. No, and we belong to God. And it's really not my hands, it's the Lord's hands. And it really not my feet. Yes, but they are my Lord's feet. And this body is not mine. No, it belongs to the Lord. And every day I should say to him, Yes, have your own way. Yes, you are the partner. And I'm nothing but the claim to mold me and shake me after your will. Do y'all hear me while I'm waiting to yield it and steal? And so then, as I leave you, do y'all hear me? Life begins at conception. And life is sacred in conception. And spiritual warfare is what abortion is. Yes, Lord. But even if you've had an abortion, do y'all hear me? The Lord sent me to tell you abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Do y'all hear me? Abortion is not unforgivable. Do y'all hear me? And aren't you glad to know today whatever your sin may be yes Lord you can find forgiveness of that sin including abortion do y'all hear me aren't you glad for first John 1 and 9 don't you hear it saying that if we confess our sin, the Lord is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Do y'all hear me? From A to Z, whatever your sin is, God, he labeled to wash you clean. Maybe it's A for abortion or B for bigotry or C for being cruel or D for being devilish or E for being evil or F for being a fool or G for being in a gang or H for being hellish or I for being iniquitous. Or J for being jealous. Or K for being a know-it-all. L, yes, Lord, for being a lion. Whatever your sin is, it may be an M for being a murderer. Or N for being no good. O for being obnoxious. P for being a pervert. Or Q for being quick tempered. It may be R for being a raisins. Or S for being sexual promiscuous. Or T for being a troublemaker. U for being unkind. W for being wicked. Why? You'll do anything. But whatever your sin is, God is able to wash you clean. Do you all hear me? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What 
God can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. His blood. Oh, shucks. His blood. His blood. It can handle your abortion. It can handle your adultery. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I know I messed up. But please give me another chance. Is there anybody glad tonight? He's a God of another channel. Ah! 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 Yeah, he's a God of another chance. Is there anybody in the building tonight? Is there anybody online tonight? Can just tell him thank him for giving you not a second chance, but another chance. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? The reason I know he'll give you another chance. I'm working on about two million myself. And I just got to tell him, thank you. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Hallelujah. Would you just wave at somebody and help me tell them if he's talking about Jesus? He's a friend of mine. Yeah. If he's talking about Jesus, he is a friend. He is a friend. He's a friend. He's a friend of mine. Aren't you glad that even when we mess up with something, as horrible as adultery and abortion, God says, I can still save you. I can still use you. I can still clean you up. God, we thank you tonight for the truth of your word. God, help us to be like those Bereans in Acts 17, to search the scriptures to see if those things are so. Lord, I'm not asking them to take my word because anything I talk them into, somebody else can talk them out of. But Holy Spirit, you know how to take that word and seal it in hearts and minds. We're not going to follow the culture. We're not going to go with what's popular or politically expedient. God, we, we want to live according to your word. And so tonight, as this message goes forth on the world wide web Lord free somebody who has been believing the devil's lie that abortion is just a medical procedure free them to God you said in, in John 8 and 32 that your people would know the truth and the truth would set them free we thank you all of this month we're we're teaching and preaching on family to God and abortion gets at the very heart of the survival of families. Change somebody's mind. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Let's tell him, Lord, make me over. Lord,
I'm telling the Lord. Lord, make me over. Lord, make me over. Lord, make me over. Make me over again. That's what I want to see happen. Make me over again. Let me close out wishing happy birthday to all of our May Burrs, Sheila Clark, Kalandra Ferguson, Robert Prince, C.J. Ballard Jr., Mother Jenny Davis, Deacon Leon Davis, Virginia Forrest, Joanne Turner, Kenneth Hurt, Lottie Williamson, my sister Mary Saddlewhite, and celebrating a birthday tomorrow, happy early birthday, Deaconess Phil Macon. Happy birthday, happy birthday to all of them. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. Receive the benediction. God, we honor you. God, we bless you. God, we thank you for having allowed us to gather together one more time. I pray as your people go forth that you would grant unto them traveling grace and mercy. I pray for every home that they would have a peaceful night's rest. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you his peace, his provisions, his prosperity and protection all the days of your lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night. God bless you all. Me.